Thank you very much, Brad. It's, it's a great pleasure to be here and uh, to be kicking off this first international turning user conference. I've been to a couple of them in the US and always found them very rewarding experiences. I'm originally from Europe, so I'm back in my home turf. I, I grew up in the Netherlands, um, lived in a number of different countries in Europe, France, Italy, and the Netherlands, of course. I, um, after obtaining my uh, PhD at the University of Leiden, I knew one thing for sure, I was never going to be a professor. My father was a professor, my mother was teaching at a university, I wanted to do something useful in my life. <laughs> and uh, I had a job lined up in industry uh, at Philips in Eindhoven, and I proudly showed my father the letter that offered me that position. And he said, why don't you take a one-year postdoc in the United States? And I'd never been in the United States, so I thought, that's a good idea. So I called up Phillips and I said, would it be okay if I deferred a job for one year to learn more about lasers and optics, which is what I was going to be working on? And they said, great idea. Just, you know, go there and then accept the job one year later. So I went to the US, and what can I tell you? It's been a long year. <laughs> Anyways, you all have one of these little clickers. You've already used them. Uh, I want to explain a little bit about them before we start talking about pedagogy, because really I want to put the emphasis today on pedagogy and show how technology can be used at the service of pedagogy. It's very easy to get completely enamored by technology and to think that technology is going to solve all the problems, right? When the VCR got invented, video cassettes, right? People thought, oh, we've solved all the problems in education. We just tape the best lectures and distribute those, and everything will be fine, and education is going to improve. Hasn't happened. Then came PowerPoint. I don't know if you've ever read that article, Death by PowerPoint, but I've sat through many presentations where I would rather have died than <laughs> continue to watch uh, the slides. Um, and you know, you find that many people jump on the technology without really thinking about the pedagogy. So I want to put some pedagogy behind the use of these devices. Um, so very quickly, there's no on-off button. I noticed there are a few people who are not familiar with technology, so my apologies to those of you who already know, but I'm going to run you through some things you might know for a second. Um, I'm going to show you the instructor uh, piece of it. I have a little controller here that allows me to open polling. If I click on this button, uh, it might be a bit small, so let me blow up. Here, you can see the number of responses. So some one of you already answered the question. I didn't ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, why don't you just press the button? There's no on off, and you see that each time uh, somebody presses, that uh, counter goes up. Now suppose I had asked a question, and you press a button, let's say four, and then a second later you think, oh no, it should be five. If you press five, your five overrides your four. It's not that you get to vote twice, okay? So keep that in mind when, you, uh, when I ask you for, uh, for input. So has everybody clicked on this button? At any point I can click on this little icon here. Let me zoom out. And I can see what the distribution is. Apparently button five is a very popular button. I guess it's because it's in the center of the display. Now let's all press one. Notice that if we all press one, the distribution, you're very good at following instructions. I love that. You're better than students, you know. They'll, they'll try to make any kind of nice pattern behind my back while I'm, but come on, the sixes and. You know. <laughs> But you see that the distribution changes. So the new click overrides the old click. If I hit this stop button, you can press as much as you want. You'll see a little sort of do not enter sign on the display saying that polling is closed. Um, <clears throat> there's also <clears throat> a software version of this that you can run on iPhones or iPads or Blackberries or computers. I haven't set this up right now because I don't know how good the Wi-Fi and the cellular reception is here, but that's very easily implementable. I'm sure that <clears throat> the turning staff will be happy to tell you more about it um, at some other point. Okay, now turn to the back of your um, receiver for a second. <clears throat> You'll see that there's a barcode, that barcode there. Each time you press a button, the device sends over via radio frequency the button you've clicked. 
and at the same time, that ID number. So the software registers the ID number and the answer. So if you make a correlation between the identity of the person holding the clicker and that serial number, you know what individual people have answered. Okay? So we don't know that here. It's completely anonymous. You don't have to worry about answering questions correctly or not. There's no credit. It won't be on the final exam, OK? Um, but that's basically all there is to it. So the technology is remarkably simple, right? which I think is a virtue. Because when you're standing, <clears throat> and I know this as an instructor, when you're standing in front of a classroom, you don't want to have to deal with complicated technology. You really want to focus on the content and on the process of teaching rather than on struggling with, <clears throat> with technology. OK. So you've already seen two questions which were polling questions, right? We're going to get to things that are a little bit deeper than polling questions. But I have my own polling question, which I want to start with as a little warm-up, too, actually, just like bread. And the first one has to do with peer instruction. I want to know whether or not you have heard me speak about peer instruction. You may have been at my talk yesterday at Surrey, or you may have seen the YouTube Confessions of a Converted Lecturer, or another one, or you may have seen me at some other place, or you may have heard me so many times that you can actually give my talk. <laughs> Um, or the whole term peer instruction might mean nothing to you. So please choose the one that's most appropriate going from the top down and enter your choice. 46, 51. Boy, we have quite a few more people than we had anticipated. I'm absolutely delighted to see that. So let's see what the distribution is. 13%. Would the people who pressed 4 please come forward? I'll happily, <laughs> I'll happily hand over the microphone to them. <laughs> um, but many people have heard me talk about peer instruction. We still have a quarter, one in four, who has no idea what peer instruction is. So I have a broad audience here, right? Just as the familiarity with these devices is kind of broad, the familiarity with the pedagogy is rather broad, too. Although I'm particularly happy to see that one in three has heard me uh, speak. Well, I've been on, the, uh, on this path of uh, you know, disseminating the pedagogical ideas for close to 20 years now, so I'm pleased to see that it has had a, an effect even here. OK, so let's start with a little reflection on our own education. So I want you, if you can, to take a little piece of paper in front of you very old technology, but very important technology. I think mankind would not have advanced that much if it weren't for that technology. And I want you to think about something that you are good at. This is, I want you to write it on the piece of paper because it's totally private information, right? It could be anything. It could be gardening. It could be solving partial differential equations. It could be entertaining people. It could be cooking, it could be whatever, right? Something you know you are really, really good at. Something you're proud of. And ideally, ideally, I want that something that you write down and then hide so that your neighbors can't see it. I, I want that to be something that's a, that has helped you advance you in your career. So clearly, it's, and you're all successful people, so it shouldn't be too hard to come up with it, okay? So I'm going to give you 30 seconds to think of that. Commit it to paper, cover it up, totally private information. Everybody ready? I'm happy to give more time. OK, everybody ready. So fold it up. It doesn't matter. You know, I, I don't need to see it. Nobody needs to see it. I just want you to commit to something. That's why I had you write it down. So now, now comes the interesting part. I want you to reflect on how you became good at whatever it is that you wrote down. What were the circumstances that led you to develop that skill? How did you become good at it? When? So think about that and write that down again or put it in your head, doesn't matter. But what were the circumstances that led you to become good at whatever it is that you wrote down? And remember, what you wrote down was something that was important in your career. OK, so 
I've done this many times with many different audiences, and sometimes I've collected the responses to see what the categories are. And essentially, the things that people write down fall into these, uh, oh, I forgot to put the question out, but write down these four categories, trial and error, by listening to lectures, by practicing, by apprenticeship, by basically tagging along with somebody who is good at it and, 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 and learning from that person. And then there's a mix of other little things that people write down from you know, friends and family to you name it. So choose now, I'm gonna start the polling. I should take the, uh, the card, there it is. Here, <clears throat> I hope that this one will work with my computer. Does it? No, I have to take my own card, which is in my bag. Okay, so choose the category that comes closest to what you wrote down on that piece of paper. Okay, 49, 50, we're close. Okay, so let's see. Wow, we're getting higher and higher, 57. There we are, here's the distribution. Clearly practicing, which is completely in line with what I've seen before, is the most important one. Now look at this distribution, and there's something really stunning about that distribution. What is it? <laughs> Lectures. 2%, which is one person out of this, and I'm, I'm sure that this person will not want to identify him or herself, <laughs> but there's only one person who chose lectures. Yet, how do we teach, right? I mean, step into any classroom around the planet, and this is what you see. In fact, I was visiting a couple of classrooms here on campus yesterday, and they all have this architecture, which dates back 3,000 years to the ancient Greek, and which were basically, which was basically developed with only one purpose, namely to focus the attention of many onto one. So that's kind of ironic, right? Only one person chose lecture and in, in, in the development of a skill that was really important for the advancement of, in life and of a career but this is the focus of most of the education. So now that we are here I would like to ask the question, what is it that is actually happening in a lecture? This is actually a picture of me teaching before I converted my approach to teaching, before I discovered how ineffective a lecture is. And uh, as you can see, uh, this was before there were computers. I'm standing at, a, at an overhead projector, projecting a slide. Now, you know, you have a computer and you use PowerPoint or any other presentation software, but the idea has not changed. I want you, and those are the two-thirds that have not heard me speak before, I want you to find a way of describing the process that is occurring on the screen behind me. What is it that is actually happening there? So just blurt it out. I want to hear something with a verb, ideally, and the two verbs I do not want to hear are teaching and learning. So go ahead. Transferring information. Transferring, you must have heard me. <laughs> transferring information. There's a f the focus of a lecture is to transfer information. And I can't resist tell you one anecdote because, you know, when I started teaching, I, I basically just stepped into the classroom and I, I started doing what my teachers had done. Right? You, start, you start to mimic your own teachers and my teachers had lectured to me so I naively assumed that's how one learns and that's how one teaches. So when I was assigned to teach a large pre-med class at Harvard, this very class that you see here on the screen, that's what I did. Ironically, the students pointed out to me that very first year that I was focusing on transferring information. And I was upset by it. This is what happened. I, um, I um, went to a colleague who had taught the class before and I asked this colleague, what book do you use? That was the only big question that was actually in my mind. I had never taught an introductory physics course, so I wanted to know, you know, what material do you use? And he said, oh, I'm a physicist, so I don't know how many physicists we have in the audience, but you might not be familiar with that book, but there's a book that has been a classic for probably more than 30 years, Halliday and Resnick. So he said, you know, that's the book we've used before. 
And I was told that I had to make sure that the bookstore had enough copies of that book in stock for the students because students in the US buy a textbook even for introductory physics courses, something that I didn't understand coming from Europe because you know, I, I don't know how it is in Europe now, but when I was an undergraduate, you would never buy a textbook for an introductory course. After all, the professor was presenting the book to you, so you know, why, why spend a, a hundred and some dollars, or whatever it was, the currency then, um, to, to buy a book? So I went to the bookstore, made sure that they had 150 copies of How Then Resnick, and as I walked back to my office, I, I, I said to myself, wait a minute, if the students have the book and I have the book, what do I do in class, right? So I went to my colleague again and I, I asked him that question and he said, oh, don't worry, there's lots of different introductory physics textbooks and he showed me his whole collection. So I started looking at his books and very quickly I identified one book which was the perfect book to teach from for two reasons. One, it had a slightly different approach. So it was not a, a verbatim copy, you know, how textbooks are. They, they tend to copy one another, but this was a different book. But the much more important reason was the book was out of print. <laughs> Students couldn't get their hands on this book. So I spent a lot of time each, for each class taking the information out of the book and transferring it to a set of lecture notes to lecture from. And in class, I would take these lecture notes and put them on the overhead projector as I do here on the picture, or I would write them on the board behind me. And because my approach was a little bit different from the textbook, I said, you know what, I'm going to give the students a photocopy of my lecture notes at the end of each class period. So in front of the door at the exits, there would be a pile of photocopies of my lecture notes so that the students, when they walked on, they could pick up one of these copies. Why do you think I handed it out at the end? Hmm? so that they would come. Well, they would still come if I put it at the beginning, right, to pick it up. But I didn't want them to just come, pick up the notes, and go back to bed, right? I want them. But in retrospect, isn't that already, isn't that already admitting that there's something wrong? Why, why force them to come and listen to me if they can get the information out of the lecture notes? Anyway, that, that, idea, that whole thought never crossed my mind. But what did happen was that after about six weeks or so, or maybe even fewer, four weeks, some students came to me and I said, Professor Mazur, couldn't we get a copy of your lecture notes at the beginning of each class period? This way we don't have to write down that much. And I had indeed noticed that each time I wrote A on the blackboard, 150 pens went A in the notebooks of the students. I once heard somebody describe the lecture method as a process whereby the lecture notes of the instructor get transferred to the notebooks of the students without passing through the brains of either. <laughs> That's precisely what was happening in my classroom. So I decided to hand it out at the beginning. And much to my relief, the students didn't just grab the notes and go back home. They took the notes, sat down, and they still copied everything because they had no time to read the notes. So that first year went by. I got really high ratings for my course because the students liked my notes, and apparently they liked my lecture style. And as often happens, when you do a good job, you're asked to do it again. I was punished for doing a good job and asked to teach this course that nobody else wanted to teach again the next year. And I said to myself, you know what, rather than issuing these notes class by class, a week before the semester starts, I'm going to send out the whole set of notes to be duplicated and on day one, students get the entire packet for the whole year. You know what the unexpected result was? The unexpected result was that about half a dozen students wrote on their end of semester questionnaire Professor Mazur is lecturing straight from his lecture notes. <laughs> Hello? I mean, what was I supposed to do? Develop another set of lecture notes to lecture from that was different from the lecture notes I gave to them? I, I was really upset. But the students were making the same point you're making. I was focusing on the transfer of information. So given the fact that I would say 99% of the classes taught around the globe, the 1% that does not fit this pattern are probably management school classes that use the case study method, law school classes, but the rest is all basically taught in this format. You could ask yourself the question, is that what education is? Is education just a transfer of information? I think we'd pretty quickly conclude no, 
Because if it were just the transfer of information, there would be no reason to do it in a mode that is completely outdated, right? We have very different ways of transferring information nowadays. First of all, we have the biggest invention of information technology ever, Gutenberg's printing press, right? Which is already 500 years old. And then we have the more modern information technology to transfer information. So there's more that needs to happen. What is it that is missing? <laughs> Reflect back on your own education. Did you learn while you were sitting in the classroom, listening to the instructors talk? Can I see a show of hands? Who believes that that's the case? Very good, but it's only one. You were probably the person uh, who... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so what is it that is missing? Or is this all we need to do? So then we can pack up today and go back home. You know, we're done for the day. <laughs> what is missing? Participation, yes, which is something we'll get into. I'm trying to get you to participate. We're still warming up here, right? Activity. Activity. But what is it that needs to happen, really, in order to become educated? Reflection. I mean, we're getting closer there. What does the reflection do? Come on, come on, wake up. Get students engaged, but hmm? feedback, yes. Feedback both to the students and from the students to the instructor, right? Because normally when you stand in front of a class, you lecture, and then you say, does anybody have a question? Students look down, they don't want to, you know. Yes? Remember something, stress is a very helpful factor. And if you don't have stress, you might uh, uh, be more on excitement. You know, when I was small, like about four years old, I learned to tie my shoelaces, which is not an easy feat. I mean, we do it daily now, but if you ever see children learn to tie their shoelaces, it's not something easy. But I don't remember being stressed while tying my shoelaces, so I don't think stress is, a, is actually conducive to learning at all, frankly. Yes? Making connections, uh, very good. I think that is very important. Making connections to what? Experience. To previous experiences, exactly. In, in, in a sense, it is sort of making sense of that information so that you can build a mental model that you can apply in a different context, right? I mean, however, I would say what happens in most of education is that the instructor delivers information to the students, and on the exam, the students, the students parrot it back to the instructor. Good. You know, you, you, you've checked off the right thing. And in problem solving, it's the same thing. The professor turns his back to the class, does an example problem, and on the exam, there's a very similar problem that the student has to solve, following exactly the approach that the professor has solved. If you deviate from that pass, what happens? Students will say, We've never done a problem like this. Well, in a sense, we want to educate our students to solve the problems that we have not yet solved. In fact, I would argue, if you've seen the solution to a problem, the problem ceases to be a problem. Right? Because a problem means you don't know what the solution is. So if you've already seen the solution or the approach to it, then it's no longer a problem. It's an exercise, maybe, but it's not a real problem. We are educating in academia the next generation of leaders of society, right? the upper part of society. So I think, in a sense, we need to train those problem-solving skills. But I, 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 I don't want to diverge too much into this. I think that the approach that we use is fails to actually promote problem-solving, creativity, innovation, because we stay on this beaten path. So I think the missing part in education or in lectures, I should say, is that students need to assimilate that information. Now, think about it, about your own education. Where is it that that assimilation took place? Whatever it is that you learned, where is it that you had the aha moments, that you saw the bigger picture, that you started to construct the forest from the trees that were transferred to you in lecture? I've asked myself that question many times. Where did it happen for me? Did it happen while I was listening to my teachers? I think no, it happened outside. In fact, in fact, most of it happened after I got my degree. A lot of it happened when I was teaching. 
And I thought I knew something, but only to discover that, oh boy, I actually don't know. I know how to you know, regurgitate it, but not really how to make sense of it. So I think if you think in a very simplistic way about education, it's a two-step process. One, you need information transfer. Right? Because if there's no information transfer, you can't even begin to educate. And that is probably why the lecture method developed. Because before Gutenberg, 1400, 1300, you know, early Renaissance when, when the first universities in Europe were founded, the only way to educate was to put the sage on the stage and the scribes taking notes. It was the only way to, to, to transfer knowledge and information from one generation to the next. Books were not a commodity. Manuscripts were certainly not a commodity because it was impossible to scale them up. You could say, why didn't the big revolution happen in the 1500s? Well, because the original printing press could not be scaled up either. It was a laborious process. And it was probably not until the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century that books became a commodity. So at least until the last hundred and some years, this was a necessity. It was the only way to educate the next generation. But now we live in an information age. And we still focus on this information transfer, even though the second step, assimilation of information, is crucial. So the standard approach takes the easy part, the information transfer, focuses completely on it, leaving the hard part to the students. If you stop to think about that in a rational way, it doesn't make sense. We should really give the easy part of this two-step process to the students and focus on the hard part, which is that assimilation. So we should flip this model. I mean, you can't do the information transfer after the assimilation, of course. That'd be nice, but it's not possible, right? But what we should do is we should, instead of putting this in class and that out of class, we should put that out of class and this inside the class. So why am I talking about this? Well, I'm talking about this because after years of teaching the way I'm basically lecturing to you right now, I discovered that in spite of my very high valuations, and in spite of my students doing well on textbook problems, they were A, not retaining the material, B, they were unable to answer very simple, basic questions. They were able to solve complicated problems, but they were doing those simply by rote, by memorization. And you know, that's a frustrating and not very exciting thing, which, which sort of explains why so many students are frustrated by their introductory science courses. Right? If you're a non-major and you have to take a physics course, you're likely not to remember that as a very fond experience. In fact, I only have to go to a party, and when people ask me what I do for a living and I say I'm a physicist, I'm treated like an extraterrestrial, <laughs> you know? Whereas, you know, let's think about it. Physics is just a fascinating way of thinking about everything because it's, 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 it's really a way of understanding the universe around us, how the universe functions. So what could be more fascinating than understanding how the universe around us works? Yet the way it's taught, road memorization, you know, is not very conducive to thinking and to actually real problem solving. So there's lack of retention of majors. There's lack of retention of the material, Brad, that question that you asked, retention, was very ambiguous. Because the retention can be, I don't know, I, 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 it's an interesting question, but I'm sort of curious to know how people interpreted that, whether it's retention of material or retention of majors within the discipline can mean two things. But in addition to problems with both in the lecture method, uh, there's a real lack of fundamental understanding. I found that 70% of the students in my class, and these are Harvard students, at the end of the semester, I'll show some data at the end, perform barely better than a monkey on a test. Okay, I'll show the data later on. Right? This, they're able to solve good problems, but if you ask them a, a simple conceptual problem, they have no idea what you're talking about. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about peer instruction, and then I'm gonna, we're gonna try it out. You will be the students in my class. I hope you've all done your reading, because as I told you, the, the information transfer has to happen before the class. 
And uh, then I'll show you some results of uh, the uh, approach. So the basic idea is let's move the information transfer out of the classroom. So that means that the students, before coming to class, have either read something or they've watched a video of a lecture I've given before. But they have to come to class somewhat prepared. I don't expect them to understand everything. It'd be fantastic if they understood everything because we wouldn't have any need for classes at all anymore, but we know that's not the case. But at least, at least, I do not want to waste their time by repeating printed information. Pressure P is defined as the limit of delta A goes to zero of F divided by delta A. They can read that. I'm not expecting them to understand it, but at least be familiar with the definition so that in the classroom, we can think about what this means, what the consequences are, how to apply it. Right? Otherwise, what I do is I give the definition in the class. They write it down in their notebook. They walk out of class not knowing anything other than having that definition in their notebook, which is also in the textbook. And then uh, instead of teaching by telling, I teach by questioning. So here's how a typical peer instruction class goes. By the way, my slides are all on the web already. You can download them. If you just go to Google and then my last name and hit the I'm feeling lucky button, you, you, you have a copy. <laughs> and if you want to tweet about my talk, my, my name is Eric underscore Mazur, M-A-Z-U-R. Um, so you don't need to furiously copy everything because my slides are already uploaded. So you can download them right now. So here's the uh, approach, and I, I apologize for the small font there, but I'll, I'll read it to you. So I'll walk into class knowing two things. One is I know that my students have already read the material. Two, I have a feedback system on the reading. I ask the students to communicate to me the questions they have about the material they've read. If they don't have any questions, they cannot get away by, say, by simply saying, I don't have any questions. I don't, <laughs> I don't accept that as an answer. If they say, if they don't have questions, which really means, usually means they haven't read, <laughs> then they have to tell me what is most interesting. But I look at these, I look at the questions they have, and they usually fall into categories. I could just walk into class and say, you had questions about this. Here is how it is, and just explain to them. But you know, that doesn't work. What I'll do is say, some of you had this question. Now think about it. I basically bounce the question back at them. So I put one of these questions, which I call a concept test, because I usually want them to focus on something that either involves a model or a concept. I put it on the screen. We're going to do it in a second. And then I poll them, which means you have to usually, but it's not necessary. I, I can tell you a way to get around it. You have to have a multiple choice question. It's not necessary. If you're interested in knowing how to use the clickers with open-ended question, I can, I can talk about that later. OK, so you click. If more than 70% gets it correct, then the question was not really an important question. You know, I basically wrap it up, I give an explanation, and I repeat the whole uh, approach with a more difficult question on the same concept. If between 30 and 70% get it correct, I tell them, Find a neighbor around you who has a different answer and try to convince that neighbor of your answer. First time I did that, I did it out of despair because I had tried for 10 minutes to explain something to my students. And no matter how hard I tried, I could see from their confused faces that they didn't understand. In fact, they were so confused they couldn't even articulate a question about it. And I had no idea how to explain it better, so I said, turn to your neighbor. And something happened in my classroom that I had never seen before. Normally, you lecture, you stop, you say, does anybody have a question? As I said a moment ago, they all look down, and nobody says anything. Here, they all talked to each other, and they forgot about me in front of the classroom. And what happened was that in two minutes, they figured it out. I was really surprised. But imagine that you have Mary and John sitting next to each other. Mary has the right answer for the right reason. She understands it. John does not. On average, Mary is more likely to convince John than the other way around, simply force of logic. But this is the key. 
Mary is more likely to convince John than Professor Mazur in front of the class there. Why? Because Mary has only recently learned it. She still sort of knows what the difficulties are that John faces. Whereas Professor Mazur has learned it such a long time ago, to him it is so patently clear that he cannot even understand why somebody doesn't understand it. It's sort of ironic. I'm sure if you've taught, it's happened to you. Somebody comes to you with a question and you wonder, what in the world is going on in, in this person's mind? You, you, you can't connect anymore to that person's mental difficulty. It's ironic, right? So the longer you teach, the less qualified you become to teach it in a sense. Anyway, so what, what you will find is that if the initial percentage is between 30 and 70 percent, after a short discussion, uh, that percentage quickly goes up to close to 90 percent. Okay, but this is a condition between 30 and 70 percent. If less than 30 percent gets it correct, they can talk whatever they want to each other. There's simply not enough students who know the right answer. Right? So usually I don't have them talk to one another. I basically revisit the concept and repeat the process with an easier question. So these are too difficult, these are too easy, these are just right. Initially it takes a little bit of time to find out what the right questions are for the audience. And since we're a very mixed audience here, it's going to be very difficult to hit that spot because it's going to be either on one side or the other, but that little area of overlap that we all have is going to be very small. And I don't know what it is because I don't know what your disciplines are. Okay, so that's the ideal pass, which we unfortunately probably are not going to have today. So what's happening here? Well, one, it's active, right? People are engaged. You have to be engaged. You can't sleep through the lecture because every few minutes your neighbor will start talking to you. <laughs> Right? And it's not just simple polling, it's actually engagement here. The second one is somebody had mentioned before feedback. There's continuous feedback. Feedback from the student to the instructor, but also to the students themselves. If the second time they're among the 10% who still gets it wrong, they see, oh, 90% of the class got it right, and I'm in the 10%. You know, it's sort of like a little alarm bell, and you've got to do something uh, about it. Are you ready to try it? OK, yeah? Good. Did you all do your reading on thermal expansion that was handed out? <laughs> well, you, by, by the way, you're laughing. I'm, uh, I'm sensing that you didn't. So, <laughs> so that's kind of a problem, right? Because this whole method is predicated. So you're forcing me to do something I should not do, namely lecture. So I, I'll have to give you a lecture on thermal expansion because that's the subject that we're going to do. Keep this idea in, in, in mind that as they wiggle back and forth, they need more space. Right? It's not exactly correct, but it, it helps you answer this question. And really, the only thing you really need to know is they get further apart from one another. Now, OK, one of the questions I could ask is I could hide this screen here, and I could say, what do atoms do when metals heat up? One, they change color. Two, they get further away from one another. And then you could click on your clicker and answer that question. But that's just regurgitating the information back, right? So let's see if you can actually take this information that I gave you, which you haven't had much time to mull over, unfortunately, and apply it to a new context. Because that's the true hallmark of learning. Can you take this? And I'm counting on you here. Yeah. Can you take this and apply it in a different context? OK, so here we go. Consider a rectangular metal plate with a circular hole in it. This is all atoms. Now I'm going to heat it up, and all the atoms are going to get further away from one another. What happens to the diameter of this hole when the plate is heated? It increases. It stays the same or it decreases. I see a lot of you click right away. I couldn't do that with a question that I've never seen before. So maybe you've heard me give this workshop too. That would be. <laughs> no talking to one another. OK, so what I want you to do now is introduce yourself to your neighbor. Neighbors, find out whether they have the same answer. If they have the same answer, you say, thank you very much, and you turn to another neighbor. Find somebody who has a different answer. If everybody around you has the same answer, get up 
But you have to find somebody who has a different answer. And then your task is to talk the other person into the answer that you have. And it's not just a matter of guessing. You have to actually apply this model of the atoms getting further away. So go ahead, talk to each other. Okay. So please, look at that. I can't even get it back to order. Fanta I can't even get you back to order anymore. So please indicate what you now believe to be the right answer. And you know, this has been really, truly illuminating. In spite of my best intentions, there were still some people talking to other people who had exactly the same answer. Uh, students do that too. They much more happily talk to the friend who is sitting next to them, even if that friend has the same answer than, than somebody uh, else. Okay, everybody has um, voted there. So, you know, one thing that is, is, is interesting is that in spite of my absolutely brilliant lecture about thermal expansion, only 26% got it right. So what have we learned from that? That you know, lecturing is not very effective, right? I mean, a, a few of you asked questions, but the you know, majority of you thought it was patently clear, yet you gave the wrong answer. Now, 26% is below 30, right? It's, that means that of four people, there's only one person who got it correct, of every four people in this audience. And, and the method really doesn't work very well when there's that little. So I, I don't expect a huge improvement. Let's see, let's see what we have now. So initially, we had, you know, it doesn't really matter which the right question is because, because we're here to talk about pedagogy, not about thermal expansion. Yeah, right. Who know? <laughs> <laughs> now, now look at that. You, you're not going to let me leave this room, <laughs> or at least not alive, without telling you what the right answer is. I mean, we're talking about atoms getting further apart. But what could be less interesting than that, right? <laughs> but you're all dying to know what the right answer is. So it shows that you know, this is very different from just telling you what it is. Right? I could have just given you a lecture and then said, when you have a rectangular metal plate with a circular hole in it and you heat it, the diameter of the hole <laughs> okay, so initially we had 26% for choice number one, 18 for choice number two, and 56 for choice number three. The correct choice is number one. <laughs> and you know, I have to compliment you. I have to compliment you for with just 26% having doubled that. I, you know, in my own class, I see that very rarely. When I see 26% for the right choice, I abort the question because it's been too hard. So you've done a good job. Now again, you're not gonna let me, probably you've forgotten again that this is about pedagogy, not about metal <laughs> plates. But I, 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 I'm quite sure that there's a need for me to explain why that <laughs> hole gets larger. But anyway, it, this doesn't matter, you know. <laughs> this doesn't matter because I'm not here to teach you thermal expansion. Notice the incredible level of engagement, right? You're, you're, you, you take ownership of this knowledge rather than just committing it to memory or writing it down. Right? That's the important thing. If I just had polled you and then gone on, would not have accomplished the same thing. So a lot of questions that I, I, I get from people, can this only be used with questions that have correct answer? I think if you would have asked me this when I first developed this approach to teaching, I would have said yes. But I've become aware that that's not true at all. You can use it with lots of things that require critical thinking or, or, or thinking or moral reasoning or whatever. I teach a workshop on ethics. And I use it in the workshop on ethics, too. In ethics, there is, on one side of the spectrum, things that are clearly right, and on the other side of the spectrum, things that are clearly wrong. In between, there's usually a gray area where you can talk about as long as you want, and you're never going to get agreement, because different people draw the line at different places.
Yes, it's important to sort of know roughly where people are with their you know, dividing line between right and wrong. And it's becoming very important, especially in science, to train students in responsible conduct. And I, I conduct workshops where I ask questions. And I'm going to do one with you. This is about a, uh, an image, a microscope image. And again, there's some science behind it, but it doesn't really matter what the science is. This is an image that was obtained by some colleagues of mine in the chemistry department. These little spheres that you see there are little polymer plastic spheres, which have a diameter of about one micrometer, one millionth of a meter, about a hundredth of the diameter of a human hair. And under certain conditions, these little spheres arrange themselves in perfect triangles, as you see on the screen. This was a paper which appeared in Science. And the point of this paper was to show that these little spheres arrange themselves in this triangular fashion. So this was one of the images to prove that. Well, this was actually not the image. I'll show you the image that was actually published. Because I am a big Photoshop fan. And uh, I'm going to take the original microscope image, which is here. And I'm going to manipulate it. Let's call it improve it for publication. View fit on screen. There we go. There's the original image. Right? And you can see, first of all, that it doesn't have much contrast. So I'm going to take it through five steps, improving the image for publication. I want you to determine at which point I cross the line for you. Okay? At which point do you think, well, he's gone too far now. Right? No talking to each other yet. And you don't have to vote yet. I'm, I'm going to show you a summary slide after I've done all of the steps. So the first thing to notice here is that the contrast is not very good, right? So let's improve the contrast. And I'm going to, I've already done it, so I just select this one. There it is. So same image, but I've simply improved the contrast. As I improve the contrast, I notice that there are some problems, right? You can see here a little blemish, and another one there, and another one there. But luckily, there is this thing called healing brush in Photoshop. And look at that. Boom. Gone. <laughs> gone. Gone. Go on. Go. There's another one there. This one is not gone yet. There. Here one. Did I forget one somewhere? OK. So I've now removed the blemishes. So two steps. Step one, increase the contrast. Two little blemishes in the pictures that I've removed. OK. My next step, blemish is removed. The next step, notice that the center of the picture looks decidedly better than the rest, right? We have some problems here with an additional sphere inserted here and there. So I'm going to take the crop tool here, and I'm going to focus on this part of the image. <coughs> there we go. Uh, let's go back to. Uh, fit on screen. So now I've taken the central part of the image that you know makes the point that I want to make in the paper a little bit better, right? So improve the contrast, remove the blemishes, crop the central part. Okay, I'm going to take two more steps because notice we still have some problem, right? We have this annoying four <laughs> things, and then we have this little blemish here, and then. This one is not that nice, but you know, I'm really good at Photoshop. So I'm going to take this one here, and I'm going to basically <laughs> put that there. What are you laughing about? <laughs> you don't like my Photoshop skills? <laughs> and here, and there. Well, you have to admit, it looks a whole lot better. Right, I've removed the outliers now. Because there was a problem with the outliers. I mean, it's probably something that didn't work exactly the way it should have. And I basically take the better examples. And so that's step four. Now, you know, and since I'm doing this, I could actually be a little bit more radical because I can improve this image much more. I mean, let's take, whoops, let's take this image and now actually reconstruct it uh, a little bit better. Here, I'm going to have to do some additional surgery on the image. 
And you have to admit that now it looks a whole lot better, right? <laughs> so those are the, the five steps. Let's go back to my presentation. Uh, I had the original. I adjusted the contrast. I removed the little blemishes. I cropped on the central area. I removed the outliers. And then I reconstructed the image. My question to you is at which of these steps did I cross the line? Did I first violate the acceptable standard of ethics? And if you think number five is OK, you press six, right? So if you think that I should have kept the original, you press zero. If you think this is no good, adjusting the contrast, you press one. If you think removing the blemishes is not good, you press two, and so on. OK, everybody's made a choice. So now, rather than having you turn to each other right away, I'm going to actually show you the distribution. And notice that there is decidedly no agreement. 9% thinks that you should do nothing. You should take, even adjusting the contrast is unacceptable. You know, but some people, one person, thought that everything was acceptable. Everything I did. And sort of the majority is here in the center between two and three. So what I'm going to do now, rather than having you turn to each other right away, is ask one of the seven or so or eight people who chose four to give me the reasoning of why uh, removing the outliers is the first unacceptable, but cropping is acceptable. So is, is, could I ask for a volunteer of the eight people who chose four? Yes, go ahead. OK, well. Um, the cold and naked truth is that uh, 17 plus 22 is 40. 75 percent of the people here would draw the line a little bit more to the left than you did. So could I have somebody from either two or three give a counter argument of why cropping is not OK uh, and maybe even why removing blemishes is not OK? So let's first talk about the cropping. Who wants to argue against cropping? OK, so why don't you take a minute to talk to your neighbor and see you know, if you can sort of agree. You, 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 you re reveal your choice to your neighbor, and, and you argue about it, having heard the arguments that we just heard. So go ahead, talk to your neighbor. OK. In the interest of time, <laughs> in the interest of time, please indicate what you now believe to be the point at which I crossed the line. So again, if you have not changed your mind, you, you indicate the same choice. If you have changed your mind, then uh, choose another one. 34, 36, there we go. OK, so a couple of things to note before, we, before I reveal the distribution is, uh, you know, you got engaged. I don't think there's a right answer here. We could argue the rest of the morning, the rest of the week about this, and you know, we're never going to get agreement because there are so many different input variables and there are so many different considerations. Do you write it up? Don't you write it up? What constitutes real data? And so on. So there is no right answer, but you still got engaged, which means you don't need a right answer, right? You can ask questions that do not have a right answer. You can use this in a history class. You can use this in a philosophy class. You can use this in a law, business, management, whatever. Art. You know, you show a painting. You talk about interpretations of art. People don't agree on the interpretation of a painting or a piece of art, but you can use it just as well and stimulate a discussion, a meaningful discussion, about the interpretation of a piece of art, a historical event, an ethics question. Uh, I'm going to just, out of curiosity, show you the distribution. Notice that it shifted. Right? There's a shift down towards the... What I do in my class, actually, is that I have, I have these cases, and then I have a follow-up scenario that confronts the participants with the decision they have taken. So for example, the follow-up scenario for this is your paper gets accepted by science, and you get an email from the editor asking you to submit for archival purposes the original unretouched image. image. Which image do you submit? <laughs> the one that you submitted for publication? The one one step before it? 
or the actual original image. It's very interesting to see the, the, what students are uh, answering those questions. Anyway, so I, I, want, I just want to show you that you can use this not only in the sciences or in other fields where there are right and wrong answer, but basically in any discipline, anything where you want to stimulate thinking. That's the important part. Not the recall of material, but the thinking. In fact, I'm going to give you another question now that is very different. Very different. And the only reason I'm asking you this question is for you to experience the different sensation psychologically. Okay? Here's the next question. And the last question I will ask before showing you results, and then we stop. Which of the following airlines tries to save fuel by suggesting that its passenger use the bathroom before boarding? <laughs> Notice that British Airways is missing, but British Midland Airways is there. So, OK. Nine, are you kidding me? None of the above. So select an answer. No talking to one another. <laughs> I have to tell my students that too. They, after they get into it, you know, they always want to talk to each other before I tell them to turn to each other. So please indicate your answer. OK, so you know, probably you were looking at this question and asking yourself, you know, how am I supposed to know this? In fact, if you would have read uh, Time magazine or the Wall Street Journal or any any newspaper carrying uh, press releases from uh, the Associated Press, you would have known that, let's first see the distribution here, 50% of you think I'm kidding you, but you would have known that there is indeed an airline that does that, and uh, maybe 13% of you did uh, read that article because Old Nippon Airways is indeed the airline that does it that does have in the boarding areas on the monitor says it promotes it's a green airline and it suggests in the Japanese version only, in the English version it doesn't do that, you know, that you may want to visit the bathroom before boarding. Now, why is this question not interesting? Because it's simply a fact recall question. You either know it or you don't know it. it didn't stimulate any thinking. It didn't promote any knowledge. I'm sure that if I were to ask you the same question two months from now, you may remember, oh, yeah, there is an airline, but which one was it again? Right? There's no model. So I think using this simply as a polling tool, and when I, well, this, I mean the clicker, is not the right way to promote thinking. Right? I mean, if we take the hole in the plate, the hole in the plate has to do with a model, atoms getting further away from one another. You're unlikely to forget that question because you've thought about it, you've argued about it, you've thought about it more, you listened to my explanation. Microscopy image is a discussion question, but this one is just a fact. So I think the type of questions you want to ask need to do more than just a fact recall. In fact, you know, this last question, let's take it. I could have turned this into a much more interesting question, right? I could have said, all Nippon Airways suggest that its passengers go to the bathroom before boarding and, and quote the Associated Press article, and then have a discussion about whether this is a meaningful thing to do or not, right? I mean, can you estimate how much weight is saved and whether it would actually save a substantial amount of fuel? <laughs> Probably not, but why does the airline do it? Because it wants to promote this green image, right? So, I mean, there are, there are other reasons than actual fuel savings to do this. Okay, so let me end here in the last few minutes by showing you some results. I can only show you results for physics because that's the discipline I teach. I, I think it's very important that we be quantitative about what we do in the classroom. I see my classroom as a laboratory for education. Just as I go to my lab where I study the interaction of laser pulses with matter and I publish papers, I like to collect data in the classroom and publish papers on it. And I think we should all do that because if we do that, we're going to improve education. So I'm going to show you a few data. This is this thing that opened my eyes, this is a test called the Force Concept Inventory, which tests students' understanding of the concept of force, which we treat in a physics course in week two. And if you don't understand force, you cannot understand what happens in week three, week four, five, six, seven, you're, you're lost, basically. 
This is a pretest, which means it's done at the beginning of the semester. Well, at the beginning of the semester, I haven't taught them yet, so I can't take any responsibility for it. Notice, two students get 29 out of 29, meaning they get all 29 questions correct. Uh, any students scoring below 23 are not Newtonian thinkers. They're still in the dark ages. They're basically Aristotelian thinkers. And even though these are Harvard students who've already had two years of physics, some two-thirds are not making the connection between force and acceleration that they should be making. If you take a gorilla and put the gorilla behind the computer pressing buttons, it'll score about 10. <laughs> so I have a couple of gorillas in my classroom. But you know, this is before, it's strange that after two years they still score this poorly. Let's see, in 1990 I taught a completely traditional class, let's see what one semester of award-winning teaching by yours truly does to change this distribution. Are you ready? So this is the pretest. Let's look at the end of the semester now. There we go. Not much improvement, right? And we still have some gorillas. And we still have more than 60% not understanding the concept of force, which is so central. It's covered in week two. And if you don't understand force, you can't understand anything in physics. How did they do on their exams? How did they pass their exams? Simply by following procedures and rote memorization, which they forget two weeks after the exam, or maybe a month, or maybe two months. And the only thing that's left is the final grade, the mark, I think you call it here in England, and a lot of frustration. No understanding is left. So let me show you now what happened in 1991. So this, you notice that in 1990, I did improve it somewhat, but very little. In 1991, which was the first year that I implemented peer instruction, and I did not yet know which were the questions that led me in that middle pathway, you know, between 30 and 70 percent. Uh, here's the pretest, very similar to 1990 and 1992 and 93 and 94. The pretest doesn't change very much. And notice that there is a much, much bigger gain. In fact, here I doubled the gain from 1990, and in subsequent years I tripled it simply by choosing better questions. So that means they understand force better. But what about textbook problems? Right? After all, you want them to also do well on textbook problems. And in 1991, I decided I was not going to waste students' time by turning my back to them and solving a problem on the blackboard for them. Why? Because imagine you're learning, you want to learn how to play the piano. You don't just go to a concert and listen to Murray Pariah playing the piano, right? You've got to sit at the piano and play. Or say you are training for a marathon. You don't sit in front of the television eating popcorn watching marathon runners on TV. You've got to do the running. Same thing for physics problems. You don't learn physics problem solving by watching a Harvard professor solve physics problem. You've got to solve the problems. So in 1990 or 91, I decided I was not going to do it for them. They had to do it themselves with our help in the tutorial session or for homework. So, but I wanted to check what happened to their performance on the examination. So what I did in 1991 was repeat an exam that I had given in 1985. I'd kept meticulous data for some, because I, I'm a database junkie, so I had entered everything in the database. I was able to reconstruct this histogram in 1985. The average in 1985 was 62%. I said to myself, as long as that average doesn't change that much, I'm happy because I know they understand the basics better. But you know what? They did better, statistically significantly better than in uh, 1985. So that means that better understanding leads to better problem solving, even if you do less of it in class. <laughs> Actually, if you stop to think about it, that's not that surprising, right? But the really important point is this. For many, many years, from when I started teaching to 1991, I had been fooling myself into believing that the students were doing a good thing simply by looking at their problem-solving ability. But it gave a very misleading picture. They were just doing these problems by rote. They were not actually understanding. So I think our assessment needs to change. And the great thing about the clickers are it's a sort of continuous formative assessment. 
You know what is going on in the minds of the students as an instructor. The students have a continuous, non-threatening way of assessing their own knowledge and of addressing the shortcomings in the knowledge, not completely, but at least to some degree, right then and there in class, rather than just taking notes and then thinking about it later. So in conclusion, oh, I was going to show, uh, I was going to show a little movie about the students. Should I do that? I think the lectures were really good, and it worked out really well, the idea of everyone teaching each other. You learn the material so much better when you have to teach it. Um, and you are trying to convince the person next to you of your answer. If it's the mirror right or they're wrong, or trying to find, if you both have the same answer, trying to think of uh, different ways to explain the same thing. And you intuitively grasp the material better if you have to explain it to someone else. The nice thing is, once I learned something, I felt like it was committed to memory, and it still is, as opposed to something that I only learned once, or maybe in passing, reading a textbook. So I feel like the difference between that, that teaching style really helped me um, learn the material better while I was learning it, and so I wouldn't have to sort of go crazy the night before the exam and, and relearn everything. It was more relaxed studying. So, in conclusion, I hope I've started to demonstrate to you that active engagement greatly improves the learning gains. You've seen some of the data. If you want to see more data, there's plenty of data on my website and in many other articles that have been peer-reviewed articles that have been uh, published. And I think the technology facilitates this active engagement. And I want to re-emphasize the point I made at the beginning. The technology should be helping the pedagogy. And I've given you here, I think, some pedagogical tools that you may want to, to uh, to adapt and adopt in, uh, in your teaching and the teaching of your uh, colleagues. And I want to, again, emphasize it's not just a polling tool. It's an engagement tool. We want to make this gray mass in our skulls work out. So thank you very much for your uh, attention. If you want more information, that's the URL of, uh, of my website. And uh, if you want more information on the clickers, you know where to go. And you can follow me on Twitter right there. Thank you so much for your attention.